You've heard many sermons, I am sure, on the new birth experience. But this morning we want to talk about life after birth. Jesus said you must be born again. But what then? What is it that's supposed to happen after birth? After conversion? After baptism? After church membership? The popular answer is, well, what's supposed to happen? Of course, peace. Paul's answer, what's supposed to happen after birth? Fight. The popular answer, after new birth comes rest and contentment. Paul's answer, you were born to fight. 1 Timothy, the 6th chapter and the 12th verse. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I want to emphasize this morning, especially the first part of that verse. These are the words that I wish so much might go home with you today, and go to bed with you tonight, and get up with you in the morning. Our focus fight the good fight of faith. Particularly, we want to focus on three words. First of all, the word fight. Fight the good fight of faith. The Christian life involves a daily battle with self. The Christian life is a fight. And if you aren't purposely and actively and aggressively fighting, you're not winning. Now when an army stops fighting, they may call it a number of things. They may call it a ceasefire. They may call it a stalemate. They may call it retreat or since everyone wants to put a positive spin on everything, they may call it strategic withdrawal. But one thing is certain, if the army isn't fighting, it isn't winning. If you and the Lord are not busily fighting the devil, the devil is winning in your life. You cannot win unless you fight with everything you have. Paul in his letter to the Ephesians describes this fight and we just read that as our scripture reading in Ephesians 6, 11 and 12. Paul says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And then he talks about that we need to become equipped with the armor of God. We are in a battle. We are in a fight. Now, when I was a boy growing up, I used to enjoy watching boxing matches, watching fights. I've since discovered that that's just a brutal sport and I, I wouldn't watch it. But back then, of course, everything was just on TV. You know, they would have the big fights, Ali, you know, fighting for the heavyweight championship of the world. And so I used to follow that a little bit and used to enjoy watching it. Of course, now you have to pay a lot of money and watch it on pay-per-view. But I wouldn't now. It, it is just a brutal sport. I mean, the whole object is just to knock your opponent out. But reading the biographies of fighters or boxers in general is very interesting. You'll find that typically they come from a poor, a disadvantaged, a hungry background. 
And they found that one way to success that worked for them, and that was to fight. And so they would fight their way up the ranks. And eventually, if they had enough talent and persevered, they would become champion and smell the sweet smell of success and then typically grow lazy after a while and then they got licked. An average boxing match might be only a half an hour of actual time in the ring if it goes the distance, but it represents countless hours of conditioning, of training, of sparring, of studying your opponent's strengths and weaknesses. Muhammad Ali, during the last several years of his career, when he was interviewed, would typically say something like, well, it's just an awful lot of work. And then ultimately he lost the championship. Even the old time fighters of the 18th century, you know, those bare knuckle fighters, their training was taken as seriously then as it is now. I came across an article written in the late 1700s. So this is over 200 years ago. And it detailed the popular training regimen of the day. It said this, the skilled trainer attends to the state of the bowels, of the lungs, and the skin, and uses such means as will reduce the fat, at the same time invigorate the muscular fibers. He is sweated by walking under a load of clothes and by lying between feather beds. His limbs are roughly rubbed. His diet is beef or mutton, his drink strong ale. Now I'm not recommending health reform today. I'm just reading what was written a long time ago. He enters upon his training with a regular course of physic, which consists of three doses. He must rise at five in the morning, that lost me right there, run half a mile at top speed uphill, and walk six miles at a moderate pace, coming in about seven to breakfast, which should be beef steaks or mutton chops with stale bread and old beer. After breakfast, he must again walk six miles at a moderate pace, at 12, lie down in bed without his clothes, not sure about that, half an hour. On getting up, he must walk four miles and return by four to dinner. Immediately after dinner, he must resume his exercise by running half a mile at top speed and walking six miles at a moderate pace. One day's regimen. If you add up all the miles of sprinting and walking, that's 23 miles that he's putting in in a day. A marathon is just over 26 miles. Under the rules of the day, back in the day, which required a fight to the knockout, or surrender, or just collapse from exhaustion, all of that road work made sense. And a very long fight, simply staying upright and paying attention could become a problem after an hour or so. The focus was all about on stamina. Fighters of today certainly have a very different training regimen that they employ, but they still require complete effort, complete focus, and complete discipline. It takes everything there is. You have to be completely dedicated to be a successful fighter. You have to fight with all you have to win in the spiritual fight. You can have a half-hearted membership. You can have a half-baked respectability. But there is no such thing as a half-Christian. Christianity takes everything there is. It is a surrender of not just parts of your life, but of your entire life. Now, Christianity is not only a battle with self, it is a daily battle, a daily surrender. No matter what your experience seems to be spiritually, every day you have a perpetual battle with self and you continually want to do right with part of your nature and you want to be selfish with the other part. 
And you might even reach the point where you figure there must be something wrong with your experience or something wrong with you. May I suggest this morning, if you're having a daily struggle with self-centered tendencies, you're an awfully good company. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I die daily. You see, some people think that the self, that the I that we struggle with, has to die once a lifetime at conversion. Something that the I has to die once a year, like at camp meeting or maybe a week of prayer. Something that the I ought to die once a quarter at communion service. And a lot of folks seem to think that the I needs to die once a week when we come to church to worship. But the successful growing Christian knows like Paul, the I must die daily. There are no successful Christians more than one day old. Now I believe we lay too great a burden upon the new birth. Although absolutely essential, the new birth doesn't change our sinful nature. There is nothing that can happen to you that will change your self-centered tendencies until the second coming of Christ. We need tend to presume that if we've been converted, if we've been baptized, if we're in the right church, then surely our nature will change. This is not Christianity. Christianity is not in this life the eradication of our sinful nature, but the continual counteraction of our sinful nature through the indwelling Christ. Every day your self-centered, sometimes we call it the carnal nature, tries to make a comeback. Then every day you must have a new experience with Christ to offset that. And this is a fight because the carnal nature just naturally comes back. But surrender to Christ is only through invitation, through an act of your will, something that you choose every day. If you will allow yourself to drift, no matter what your experience may have been sometime in the past, the carnal nature is the natural direction that you will go. And so all of Christianity has to be a fight because Christianity simply is not natural. I invite you to turn with me now to the book of Matthew. Matthew, the 14th chapter. Matthew, the 14th chapter, verses 25 to 31. It's a story of Jesus having just fed the 5,000, dismissed the disciples, and they went rowing out into Galilee. In the midst of the night now, he appears to them in the middle of a storm. Matthew 14, let's begin with the 24th verse. Matthew 14, beginning with verse 24. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out in fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Peter, walking on the water, suddenly began to sink. 
Why did Peter begin to sink? Because sinking was Peter's nature. You see, responding to Jesus' invitation to come did not eradicate Peter's nature. It didn't eradicate the law of gravity. It was still natural, although he was walking on the water, the natural thing for Peter to do was to sink. And when he took his eyes off Jesus, the power of Christ no longer counteracted the tendency to sink and so he sank. Don't you see that's the way it is in the walk through life. Even after we have responded to the call of Jesus. And we have stepped out of the boat. And we are now walking on water. And by the way, don't forget that you can walk on water. God is waiting to do something special and something miraculous for you. That is surely as amazing and as supernatural as walking on water. But when you respond to the call of Jesus, and when you begin to do that supernatural thing of living the love-centered instead of the self-centered life, do not presume that you have become automatically and naturally love-centered. You still have a tendency to sink. And when you, like Peter, for a moment, take your eyes off of Jesus and say, how about this? I can walk on water. You're going to get wet. The Christian life is a continual battle, a daily battle with self. Okay? Fight. The good fight of faith. Let's notice our next word. The second word I want to emphasize is faith. Fight the good fight of faith. If we stop the sermon right now, I think we might appear very legalistic. Because you see, the fight is not to do good deeds. The fight is not to walk on water. The fight is not to work on your swimming skills so that you can stay afloat on your own. The fight is to keep the eyes on Jesus. The fight of the Christian is to continually have a more complete trusting relationship with Christ. That's faith. Faith is simply a trusting relationship with Jesus. The simplest definition that I have seen comes from the book Education, page 253. Faith is trusting God. Faith is trusting God. There is a fight. The fight is not to do good deeds. The fight is to have faith. We fight for trust, for a trusting relationship with Jesus. When Johnny was about three years old, he was out playing in the yard, and his father was up on the second floor, sitting next to the window, watching his son play down below. And he looked out, and he could see him playing, and he needed him for something, and so he hollered out the window, and he said, Johnny, come on up and see Daddy. And you know what Johnny did? He walked over straight to the house, stood right underneath that window, and he reached up with both hands and he stood on his tiptoes ready to come to daddy. Now that boy had no idea how he was going to get there. He only knew that his father had asked him to come and father would somehow make it possible. And you could bet your life daddy did. Well, for that kind of a trusting relationship with Jesus. Is there somebody in the congregation this morning whom God seems to be asking something to do that you just don't know how it's going to get done? Just come as close as you can, raise yourself up on tiptoe, and say, Lord, if you ask me to do it, I know that you will see that it gets done. I trust you. That is the fight of the Christian. For a trusting relationship with God. Remember that was Peter's problem. He didn't trust that Jesus would keep him afloat. 
Now, I'm inclined to believe that it's a harder fight to have a good relationship than to do good deeds. If you look at the religions of the world, they're all about doing good deeds. What do you need to do in order to secure the favor of the gods? Or to keep from being punished by the gods? Whether it's praying five times a day or whatever it is, whatever Christian or whatever religion of the world there is, there's always a list of things that you need to do to try to win the favor of the gods. And the reason some of us have settled for doing good deeds instead of having a good relationship is because good deeds are easier. Now, wouldn't it be easy if God just made a list somewhere in Scripture and said, if you do this and you do this and you read, you know, one hour from your Bible every day and you do this and you do this and there's just a list of very concrete things that you know that you can do. There wouldn't be any of us that wouldn't be doing those things on the list and knowing that we had eternal life. But that's not the way it works. The fight is to have a relationship with Jesus. The reason some of us have settled for doing good deeds instead of having a good relationship is because good deeds are easier. And by the way, I think that this is why Jesus opposed divorce. Because Jesus knew that fighting for relationship was so terribly difficult as long as divorce was an alternative, that people wouldn't fight their best. They would just give up. It's not that he wanted people to be miserable, but it's because he knew that a relationship of that caliber is something that has to be fought for. It takes a complete, strong, unbending dedication or relationship doesn't work. The human tendency is to take the easiest way out. By removing what seemed to be an easy way, Jesus gave us a better chance to learn to fight for relationships. And by the way, divorce isn't always such an easy way either. A young businessman came to his pastor as soon as the pastor had arrived and began his ministry at the church, and he expressed to the pastor that there was nothing in the whole world that he wanted as much as a divorce. And before long, he got it. Years went by, and one day he came to that pastor, very long-faced, and he said, you know what, pastor? If I had known how much work it is to get a divorce, I never would have gotten one. He had to travel clear across the country in order to see his child. He had to start his business all over again because of the financial settlement. And he said, you know, Pastor, if I had worked just half as hard for my marriage as I had to work in my divorce, I could have stayed married. But a relationship is something that takes work. I'm inclined to think that good deeds are more <coughs> habitual than good relationships. I want to talk for just a moment now, especially to those of us who are growing a little bit older. You see, hopefully most Christians form pretty good habits. And many of our so-called Christian deeds we can almost perform by habit. How many of you had a real battle this week to keep from getting drunk? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I'm guessing I wouldn't see any. Probably not, because you formed different habits. How many of you, when you went to Safeway yesterday to buy your groceries, had to say to yourself, I will not steal, I will not steal, I will not steal anything from Safeway today? Probably not too many of us. Because we can come to the place where we do a lot of good habits almost by nature. But all of your life, you're going to find certain kinds of people very, very difficult to have a good relationship with. Righteousness by faith is not a labor-saving device. 
Some are very attracted to the beautiful theology of righteousness by faith because behavior takes work, it takes effort, and relationships, well, you can just do what comes natural. It's just, it's natural, it's easy, you know, just believe. No, it's not that simple. Relationship comes only if you fight for it. Let me make an observation about young people in general. Sometimes I think that one reason that righteousness by faith, you know, salvation through relationship and forget about behavior, the reason that's very attractive sometimes to young people is that they haven't yet learned how much hard work a relationship is. Because their one long-time relationship has been with their family up to that point, and especially with their parents. And they have found that their parents love them no matter how stinky they are. And some of you have been perhaps a little bit disagreeable, but your parents went on loving you. And so you see nothing to a relationship. It's easy. And then one day it happens. And you're jilted for the first time. And you experience what it means to have a broken heart. It happens to everybody sometime. And when it happens, that's when you learn that relationship, real relationship, is something that you have to work at, something that you have to fight for. I'm inclined to think our young ladies tend to learn it faster than do we men. Because I think they have a tendency to take relationships a little more seriously. College girl. One night lying in bed, her social life had not been going too well. And she says to herself, I'm going to attract somebody from that other dorm on the other side of campus. I'm going to. And I'm going to do whatever it takes to make that happen. I'm going to get in shape. I'm going to lose some weight. The next morning, she dashes down to the dormitory kitchen and she writes somebody else's name on all the goodies she has stored in the refrigerator. She goes up to the window ledge in her room and sweeps it clean of all those special snacks that she likes to munch on while she's studying. She turns her bed around so it faces away from the pizza parlor. She gets up from the cafeteria table half hungry. She fights every single taste bud down to the last nubbin and then she disciplines herself to exercise every day. Why? She knows she must fight if she's going to have the relationships she's seeking. Mm -hmm. And this is the way it is with Jesus. If you have felt you've had the conversion, if you've had the new birth experience, and yet you're not as close to Jesus as you would like it to be, don't presume that there's something wrong with you or with him. You haven't gone on a daily basis working at it, fighting for it, fighting for the relationship. One more word we need to cover here. We said fight, fight the good fight, and then of faith. Not to do good deeds, but to have faith, to have trust, to have a trusting relationship. Our third word, fight the good fight of faith. The fight for faith is a good fight. You can have faith if you will fight for it. The fight for human relationships doesn't always work. And this young lady that lost the weight and attracted the young man who became her husband, one day he got busy with his career and he starts becoming very distant. And she finds that the kind of intimate relationship she wants with this particular person doesn't seem to be working anymore. And she loses heart, and then she begins to gain the pounds back. Now, I'm not sure we can always guarantee that fighting for a human relationship will work every time, because the other party may give up. It does take two to make a relationship work. But the beautiful thing about a relationship with Christ is that we can guarantee that fighting for a relationship with Christ will work. 
that he will never let us down. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Hebrews 13 verse 5. Fight the good fight of faith. What is a good fight? A good fight is a fight you can win. The Jerusalem Bible puts it this way. Fight the good fight of the faith and win. Now I want to pause here for just a moment. This is a lot harder for some than for others. Because if you've been disappointed in human love, you will probably find it very difficult to believe that you can have love even if you fight for it. Because we learn to love only by being loved. 1 John 4.19 says we love him because he first loved us. And if there is someone here who feels, well, this is difficult for me, I must be awfully hard-hearted. Probably you didn't experience much love either in growing up as a child, as a young person, or with adult relationships. You didn't experience much love, and you're scared to death to trust it. But listen, if human love has let you down, don't you see how much more desperately you need divine love? That is the only love that will never let you go. It's the only love that will never fail. I want to read Romans. If you want to turn with me to Romans 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 37 to 39. Romans 8, 37 to 39. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You will find it especially worthwhile fighting for a love relationship with Christ. It will never fail. It's the fight that we can all win. Now I enjoy watching sports I probably watch more than I should my favorite thing is watching football so it's a good time of year for me when football season starts but it's interesting I've got you know my favorite pro team my favorite college team that I follow and watch them whenever I can but everyone starts the season like in the NFL there's 32 teams everyone starts the season the same way zero zero record everybody thinks maybe this is the year you know, we picked up some people in the draft. We made a few off-season acquisitions. We're healthy as we start the year. This is going to be our year. 32 teams feel exactly the same way as they start the season. And already, a couple of weeks in, I guess it is, a lot of teams are having second thoughts. But the interesting thing is that when you get to the end of the season, there can only be one winner only one winner the other 31 teams all feel like their season was a complete and total failure and that's what's gotten me to think recently that maybe sports is kind of a depressing thing you know you got about a three percent chance that your team's going to make you happy at the end of the year but the beautiful thing about christianity is that every one that has a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ can be a winner. Amen. And I love that about Christianity. It's not a competition. It's something that we can all win through Jesus. And so what we're saying today, what I'm really trying to challenge you to, is to a fight. Fight the good fight of faith. 
you're walking down the street and somebody rushes up behind you and taps you on the shoulder, what's your instinctive reaction? You're going to turn right around and see what, what just happened. I wonder today if the Lord Jesus is maybe tapping you on the shoulder. I don't know what he's saying to you specifically. To some here, he may be saying, you've been resting too much. Let me help you fight. You want to have a relationship, but you've not been wanting it enough. Your priorities are wrong. You're not making that time every day for that relationship to grow. To others, he may say, you've been fighting hard, but your fight has been to do good deeds, to get rid of a bad habit. I want you instead to fight for a good relationship. Let's go out of this church today fighting fighting side by side with Christ. Brethren and sisters, the time of rest will come soon enough. And when it does, we'll be able to say with Paul, we've been focusing on 1 Timothy, the second letter of Paul to Timothy, still echoes that same message of fighting. 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. In his parting words to Timothy, he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day. And not to me only, not just going to be one winner, but unto all them also that love his appearing. I have fought a good fight. With Paul, I urge you today to keep fighting, to persevere. And when you fight, fight the fight of faith. Don't just fight to eradicate bad habits in your life and sins that are plaguing you. Fight the fight of faith and like Paul, fight the good fight of faith. Be a winner. Our closing hymn is number 279 in your hymnal. 279, Only Trust Him.